Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another lesson from God's Word. We're looking at Luke's life of Christ. Today, the Gospel according to Luke chapter 21 and verse 7. Luke chapter 21, verse 7. And the Lord has just announced that not one stone is going to be left upon another in the temple building in Jerusalem. So that leads to this interrogative in Luke 21, 7. So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign rule will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, Take heed that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is drawn near. Therefore do not go after them, but when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately." Now, this tells us a number of things about our Lord's return, about his second coming to earth. And, of course, later the epistles will reveal something that the Old Testament prophets weren't aware of and something that was only hinted at obliquely in the Gospels. The epistles will tell us that there's this church, this spiritual body composed of Jew and Gentile that has a different destiny from this world. It's going to be called up to meet the Lord in the air. And the Lord is going to take us home to the Father's house. But then the Lord will take up Israel once more and bring Israel as a nation to belief in Messiah. Not that every single person in that nation will believe, but by the end of the future tribulation period, there will be a believing remnant that are looking to the Lord to come and save them. And so the things he describes pertain to that time of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation as the New Testament describes it. Things that we can already see in measure right now, but things that are going to intensify and be worse then in that future day. Now, the first thing we have to be aware of is that the Lord said in verse 8 that he warned them about deception. He said, take heed that you be not deceived. And when we talk about Messiah and the future coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the return of the Savior, this is a subject that has been very much surrounded by deception because there are many false Christs. There are many fraudulent messiahs. There are many people that have arisen in modern history as well as in ancient and every time in between to claim that they are of God and even to claim that they are the Christ. But he says, take heed that you be not deceived. So we have to be aware, friends, that we're living in a time of great deception. The old adage is that a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth even has its boots on. And that's kind of a comical way of saying it, but it's probably never been more true with the internet and social media and the platforms we have for broadcasting. Whatever we want to say, whatever we think, whatever our take on something is, it's now easier than ever to disseminate false information to have, to use a modern phrase, fake news, and to use information in a very skewed and deceptive manner. And I just have to laugh at the talking heads that one hears so much in our world today, and they all tell you that they want to tell you the truth, and yet the things they say are diametrically opposed to each other. So not everybody's telling the truth. And even some of the people that we may favor or we may say, oh, I like listening to this person. You know, they live in a business that is about getting people to view and about being sensational. And so they will shade and alter the truth if it suits them. Unfortunately, in spiritual things, it's even worse because some of the Lord Jesus Christ's most scathing denunciations comes against false teachers, against those who lead others astray, those who teach a false gospel. And the apostles felt the same way. The early church had that view, that if you teach another Christ, if you teach another gospel, you are accursed. Galatians 1, just to name one cross-referencing passage. Now he says, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he. The he is italicized. So there's that emphatic but also familiar name of God, the I am that I am. And many are going to come claiming to be divine, claiming to be God. And we can think about, in our own times, David Koresh. We can think about Jim Jones. We can think about Charles Manson. And we can think about uh, uh, Louis Farrakhan, all of whom have at one time or another 
said that they are the Christ. And so there's great error in these different groups. And the Lord forewarned us about this. And it goes back even to ancient times. At one point, when the apostles are brought before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 5, Gamaliel gets up and says, now beware what you're going to do to these men, because before there were certain false messiahs, there were certain people who came and claimed to be of God and leading us to freedom. And their movements each came to nothing. There was Thutis and there was another man named Judas, and these were false Christs. They didn't pan out. But beware, if this is of God, you don't want to fight against God. So that was a warning, because even in their day, they knew about false Christs coming. Uh, but he says, therefore, do not go after them, verse 8, but when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Now, it's certain that violence is endemic to the human world, that unfortunately we can go back to ancient times and find plenty of crime and violence and murder. We can find warfare, and it is still very much with us today. And yet we're coming out of a, an era when in the 20th century we had the bloodiest century on human record. And of course, in the century we're in now, portends to be maybe even worse because now of course our population is larger and our weaponry is more potent as well that we are able to inflict more harm and damage on other people and people that wouldn't have had the power to kill other people at least very easily in ancient times now can do it uh, with many of the drugs that are easily available or many of the poisons that can be employed or many of the weapons that can be used and so we have these sorts of things with us today and it's increasing wars and commotions but the lord tells us do not be terrified for these things must come to pass first god has a plan he's not going to stop the violence all at once he's not going to come and make evil stop right away because god is a righteous judge and if he intervenes in world affairs to put down evil you better believe he's doing a thoroughgoing job of it. And he's not going to stop until all of those who are in rebellion against himself are brought to judgment. You know, so often we can look at this dictator or that dictator, this nation or that nation, and we can complain and we can say, why doesn't God do something about them? Well, God will do something about them. But what about our sin? We could ask the question, why doesn't God intervene and do something about my sin? Why haven't I been judged? That's a good question for a human being to ask. It's better if you as a human being can say, you know, it's because the Lord Jesus Christ has died as my substitute. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and he died for my sin. So I know there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I will not come into judgment. I've passed from death unto life, as John 5.24 says. So there's wonderful salvation in Christ. But when we look at the evil and the violence in the world that people are perpetrating on one another, God doesn't intervene in every case and stop it. God may curtail it. God certainly brings each human to an end. Is it is appointed once for a man to die, but after this the judgment, Hebrews 9.27 says. So Mussolini's have risen and fallen. Hitler's have risen and fallen. So has Stalin, so has Mao, so has Pol Pot, so have, as Saddam Hussein, and many others. And they are going to stand before the great white throne and have to answer for what they've done. And the nations will be judged in the future. So it's not that... This is going to go on forever and interminably. The end will come, but it's not going to come, says the Lord Jesus, immediately. Verse 10, Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. So really, we're talking about cataclysm on the earth. We're talking about humanly caused disasters like wars and nations and kingdoms fighting one another and also natural disasters like great earthquakes and famines and pestilences which we're coming through a long time of pestilence with COVID-19 and uh, there are many other diseases like malaria 
and Marburg virus and Ebola virus and many other things in the world that kill people every year. We're living in a fallen world where because of sin we have disease and death and unfortunately these things are not going to abate. They're not going to go away. They're actually going to get worse before the coming of the Lord. He says that there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Now, Revelation, of course, is full of these signs. It talks a lot about the things that will be seen on earth and the things that will be seen in the sky that will alert people to the reality of God, to his wrath against sin, to the fact that he's coming back to judge the earth. Because God is not coming trying to catch people out. He's not trying to come and judge us. He wants to save. That's his first instinct. Isaiah the prophet called judgment his strange work. He's a merciful God and a gracious God, a God who delights to forgive sin and to save sinners. And so uh, when we think about the work of the Lord, we should remember his coming will be like a thief in the night, says 1 Thessalonians 5. But is that because God is sneaking around? Is that because he's skulking about somewhere trying to deceive us or hide from us? No. He says, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people. As we've seen already, Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. God is looking at humanity, looking for them, seeking them, coming to save them if they will have him, and saying, Be saved while there's time. <clears throat> Turn from your sin and your independence of God and cry out to the Lord to be your Lord and Savior. This is what God wants. And even in the future tribulation, many people are going to turn to the Lord. Many people will be saved through the preaching of 144,000 Jews who come to know that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is Lord and Christ. And they will follow him and preach him. <coughs> Excuse me. And the two witnesses will preach ever so effectively until the Lord finally allows them to be martyred, to give their lives as witness to the truth of what they're preaching. And many will be saved in that day. So the Lord not only talks about the natural cataclysms, the, the aspect of the creation groaning, as Romans 8 says, but he talks about, he says, verse 12, before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. Now, persecution is a reality today in the world that many of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world are suffering physical persecution today. Many have lost their jobs, even in this country, because they've taken a stand for Christ. In other countries, they've lost their freedom. They've been imprisoned for Christ's sake. They don't have enough to eat because they are loyal to the Lord Jesus and others persecute them and take from them and abuse from them. And every year, people are murdered for nothing more than the fact that they have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are many countries where authoritarian religions dominate. And our Western media doesn't talk about the fact that these religions persecute and kill Christians. It's nothing new. It's something the Lord said would happen, and in the future tribulation, it's going to happen in greater degree. It's going to happen worse than it has before, and we can read passages like John 15 and 16 that also talk about this phenomenon. He says, they'll persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, which is exactly what we see in the early days of the church in Acts, and it's what will happen again in the tribulation and what's happening to many of our believing brothers and sisters right now around the world. He says, you will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. So here they're going to stand before kings and rulers. That's something Saul of Tarsus, whom we know as Paul, he was said from the very beginning at his conversion, God told Ananias, who baptized him, that this man is set to be my witness before kings and rulers, uh, before Israel and the Gentiles. And so the Christian church is going to stand before the great for the namesake of the Lord and be a testimony. They will suffer that others may know that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is Lord, 
that he is coming back to judge the earth, that he will rule and reign over the world as king of kings and lord of lords, and that his eternal kingdom shall prevail. He says it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. Now, we might say, well, that sounds, you know, incongruous. That sounds a little counterintuitive. Shouldn't I have a battle plan of what to say? If it's going to turn out as an opportunity to testify, shouldn't I kind of put together my three-point outline or my five-point outline or my 17-point outline? Um, you know, I want to get back to my Puritan roots or something. And shouldn't I be ready with an argument for them? Well, no. These situations are so unprecedented, the suffering so intense, that there's going to have to be an entire reliance and dependence on the Lord by His Spirit in that moment. And He says, I will give you a mouth, verse 15, and wisdom, which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. So, like the apostles in Acts, we see Stephen doing this in Acts 6, that he was full of the Holy Spirit, that he was gifted, and he preached, and they couldn't confound the wisdom with which he spoke. All they could do eventually was murder him at the end of Acts chapter 7. And likewise, Paul would confound people right from the beginning of his conversion, go and talk to people about the Lord, and they couldn't gainsay what he said. Uh, this isn't, by the way, a uh, homiletics course. The Lord isn't explaining how to prepare or not in the church. I've heard brothers try to say, see, it's wrong to study the Bible. It's wrong to prepare anything. Just get up and rely on the Spirit to lead you. And of course, that's not at all what the Lord is saying here. That's not the context. Context must always determine our interpretation. We're talking about when they're brought before kings and rulers, when they're literally on trial for their lives, then they need to rely on the Lord. You know, we don't get that kind of courage we need for the extremity until we're in it. I can sit here and say, well, I don't know how I would react. I can say, oh, I, I think I'd say this or that if I were arrested, or I think I'd say this or that if I got the serious health diagnosis, or if one of my loved ones was taken. I can have my suppositions and my opinion of what I'd say or do, but I really don't know how crushing, how harmful, how painful these situations can be. And we see the gravity of it by the fact that they were going to have to rely on the Lord, and the Lord wouldn't disappoint. He says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. He says, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. So the Lord was promising them that in spite of the opposition and in spite of persecution, even from the most intimate and close quarters, the Lord had their back. The Lord was providing them with the defense and the protection that they would need. And incidentally, this doesn't mean he wouldn't let the apostles die. And they all died in one way or another under persecution. Most of them died violent deaths of martyrdom. In John's case, it seems he was exiled, and uh, that was certainly suffering for the gospel. And many of their compatriots died as witnesses to the truth of Christ. So similarly in the tribulation, many people are going to bear witness to their faith in Christ by dying. But it's as the Lord said, fear not those who, when they've killed the body, they can't do anything more. Fear him who, when he's killed the body, can cast body and soul into hell. It's that greater fear, that reverence for God, where we say, I'm going to respect God and do what he says. I must obey God rather than men, even if I must suffer for it, even if I must die for it, and I shall not lose my soul, and my body will eventually be raised to meet that soul and spirit, to be rejoined and remade, a new creature in Christ Jesus, immortal, incorruptible, to live with the Lord forever. So may God cheer us with this, and may he help us to stand even in these evil days. Thank you for listening.